So, Elliot, thanks ever so much for joining us. This is incredible. Uh, it's a huge pleasure. honor for me. I must say, before we get started, my son is 14, and his favorite era of music and his favorite band, and it has nothing to do with me, is Steely Dan. Um, it's interesting how kids now, they find music on their own, and it's so eclectic. And he, so as I was leaving this morning, I told him, oh, I'm going to go and interview Elliot Randall. And he was like, holy cow. <laughs> well, tell him I said hello. <laughs> I will. I will. So you, uh, you, you live in London. I do. I do. I've been living here pretty much since the turn of the century. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you why I decided to move here. It was because, well, you know, the studios and the recording industry in general hit a rather big speed bump, really in the 90s going into the into this century. And I thought to myself, this isn't really happening very much in New York anymore. I'm still doing jingles a fair amount, and there was a bit less creative work to do. So I thought, I like visiting England a whole lot. Let me try living here. So I did, and I made a whole bunch of, did a bunch of networking and wound up working with some really cool producers and cool acts and um, never looked back. That's incredible. And it's, uh, it's love that brought you to England? Yes, yes. My lovely wife, whom I met in Florida in 1987, and I, we, we really hit it off big time. We're married a couple of years later. And we, we did a lot of backing and forthing, you know, between London and New York. And uh, it was clear to me that I was able to make a life for myself here. And in a way, funny enough, even though I had done a bunch of recording work here in the 70s, that was a long time ago. So I was, in essence, another new kid on the block. So that brought me a fair amount of work. How did you really get your start? What was your first sort of professional gig or what was the gig that started your professional career? That's a good question. My first gig, funny enough, was accompanying my dad at an event. And I think I was 13. And I actually got paid. I'm not sure if it was $5 or $10, but I got paid. Whoa, you know. Nice. I could buy, I could buy a new transistor radio. <laughs> um, and I went from there to doing community-centered dances. I hooked up with a band uh, called The Majestics, which is the perfect name for a band in 1963, 62. But the next year was probably one of the most important years of my life, 63. For the summer, I played in Greenwich Village at a place called the Café Bizarre, which is around the corner from the Café Wa. And, uh, and one, they had four acts a night. So you'd go in at seven in the evening and not come out until three or four in the morning. Um, which is, in, in a way, you know, what better way could you learn Baptism to hone of your fire, craft? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the most important, one of the most important things out of that was the beginning of my friendship with Richie Havens. Richie was on the bill as well. And we became fast friends and we stayed fast friends really till the end. Um, I learned a lot from him. I mean, you talk about a hard driving rhythm. Holy crap. That guy could do it better than anybody. He was a whole band in himself. I, I've watched that Woodstock clip, you know, 20,000 times and I have no idea how he's playing with the thumb over the top. And Yes, you know. yes. <laughs> and every now and again to change the tuning, he might make one of his strings, you know, down a half a tone to make it a minor thing and back up a half a tone to make it a major thing. Just superb. I never asked him how he did it or what he did. I just watched in amazement. I didn't want to imitate him because I was already starting to become a stylist. But you can really appreciate somebody who's doing those very special things. We touched on earlier um, getting into the New York session scene. Was that sort of the next step? I played in a lot of live bands between 63 and maybe the end of the 60s. And a lot of what was going on was, you know, you, you'd make your money playing in, in New York City nightclubs. And when I say nightclub, I'm talking about the Peppermint Lounge, the Wagon Wheel, you know, those places where R&B was really the, 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 the main music. Good. Which was wonderful. Yeah, uh, it amazing. Just, yeah, it's something that made me 
want to excel in that particular style because there was so much to be gleaned from it. And there's a simplicity to it. And of course, the simplicity, you don't realize until years later, and, oh my God, was I overplaying then? <laughs> um, but it, it, was, it was truly remarkable. Um, in 66, 65 or 66? 65, I wound up playing in Ocean City. I think it's New Jersey, yeah. There was a club called Tony Martz. And we got booked there for the whole summer. And Tony March had three different bands. Uh, so that when one band was stopping, they'd play their theme song and the second band would pick up the theme song so that music was continuous all the way through. Wow. Now, here's, here's the, the real wow thing. One of the bands we played opposite was the band. Then Incredible. called Levon and the Hawks. And again, talk about a, a chance to learn. They were so great. I mean, even then, the, their blues was so authentic, and their rock was heartfelt, and it, it was just amazing. I, I still have the fondest memories. In fact, I remember once being in, in uh, they were staying at some hotel on Fifth Avenue, uh, and this is after the summer, and I'm in Levon's room, and he's just getting off the phone, and he said, Elliot? I just got a call from Bob Dylan. They want us to, <laughs> so I was like almost there, you know, and I was like, wow. And the rest of course becomes history with them. So that was 65, 66 through 67 for the year. I moved out to, of all places, Lima, Ohio. And um, why did you do that? Well, I had played there. I had done a gig there for a week, met a gentleman who, was just putting together a music store slash music emporium slash music school, which were very big in the Midwest in those days. And he approached me, he said, would you like to come and teach at, at my store? Said, Sounds interesting. Sure, I'll do it. You know, So a New Yorker goes to the Midwest. <laughs> Again, a whole, you know, it was, it was as strange as a New Yorker coming to England because um, it, it's really different. It's really, really different in so many ways. And I spent the year teaching. And this, that year, I must have had 40 students a week because it was all done through the store. And um, I was able to wind up with half a dozen guitar players that to this day, I'm in contact with. Um, they're really good. They make me really, really proud. Oh, it's fantastic. And, oh, it is. It's wonderful. So you've now moved to the Midwest. How do you mm -hmm. end up back in New York doing sessions? Then? At the end of my tenure, I hooked up with some friends of mine who were coming back from California on their way to New York. And they were called, wait for it, the Druids of Stonehenge. I <laughs> uh, love it. <laughs> they were a, a total psychedelic rock New York band, you know, and that, it was through them that I actually met Hendrix. So we plied our, you know, our music for nine or 10 months before I thought, okay, it's time to move on again. But an interesting story about the Druids, and if I may do a little bit of preaching about hearing, because underneath these earphones, I'm wearing hearing aids. About a week before we left, we had to play this Allen County Fair. So we're rehearsing for the fair at in the, the music store's rehearsal room. The guy said to me, hey, have you ever tried taking acid? Oh, no. <laughs> so needless to say, I did. And uh, I, I have this memory of not really waking up, but finding myself consciously sitting in front of my then super reverb amplifier, turned on 10 with my Mosrite fuzz turned all the way up. And I must have been grooving because I did it for a while. And when I came away from there, my hearing was a bit dulled. And it wasn't until years later that a really, really good uh, GP discovered my hearing loss. But, you know, kids take care of your hearing. Adults take care of your hearing. It, it doesn't come back. You traveled with the, with the band back to New York, doing asses on the way? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. It was, it, was, it was a really, it was a period piece. The, the, whole, the whole thing was like, well, out of the 60s, because it was. Um, 
but yeah, we moved, came back to New York. And at that point, what was going on principally was this new, among other things, but there was psychedelic music. A lot of it was taking place at Steve Paul's The Scene, which is where so much transpired. I mean, I remember watching the Winter Brothers come in for the very, their very first time in New York. Led Zeppelin for the first time in New York. Um, Incredible. That was the place everybody wanted to be. It was the scene. So we wound up, obviously, you know, if you're there, and it, they had a pretty loose jam scene after, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning. So we would just jam out and jam out. And one night, Jimmy and I played together, really enjoyed each other, and um, developed a fast friendship. So we jammed from time to time. Um, I got my parents to give me permission to have them come over. And you should have seen my mom's face when he came in the door. I was like, what are you doing to me? Um, and we spent a couple of little sessions at my house, mostly listening to Curtis Mayfield records, because we were both huge fans of Curtis. Beautiful. And you can hear it in his playing. You can hear it in my playing. You can hear it in Cornell Dupree's playing. Curtis was such an incredible influence to all of us who loved sensitive R&B. Did you ever record any of those jams? <laughs> Sadly, no. No, I am. I wish I had. I wish I had. Maybe somebody has a recording someplace. That would be really cool. So the last time you saw Jimmy was at the Isle of Wight Festival. Can you tell us something about that, please? Yeah, I can. It was a rather sad event. Um, although I've been advised to say what happens on the Isle of Wight stays on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> but I won't go there. Um, you know, we were backstage in this you know, tent area, rather large bunch of tents, you know, where all the acts were hanging out before they'd get helicoptered back to the mainland. And I saw Jimmy and he's looking really distressed, for lack of a better word. I walked over, I said, Jimmy, what's the matter? And he said, with this really long face, he says, you, you just sense the sadness. He said, Elliot, I don't know who my friends are anymore. I just, this business is driving me crazy. I just, all I want to do is make music and I'm being pulled from part to part. And I understood it. I think I understood it. It was just weeks later that I found myself playing in Paris and got the news that Jimmy had passed away in London. And something happened to me that night where you call it, you know, the, the bulb going off or whatever it was. I thought to myself, Elliot, you don't want to be a rock and roll star, do you? <laughs> and the answer was, no, I don't. Which is what kept me trying to find a place in between. Look, I love I love when people like what I do. Obviously, it's great. You know, you you and any artist wants to be appreciated, but not everybody wants to be. You know, the big Kahuna on stage with. I love being on stage as well, but I don't want to be the the main focus. I enjoy being part of a group, a part of an, you know, a, a, a set of interpersonal efforts, and using my name. What's the big deal? You know, if people get to know my name. Great, I'm happy. If people get to appreciate my music. I'm happy. So it was really quite that quite simple. What do you attribute what he was saying to? What I mean is, like, I can understand a, 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 on a sort of global scale of you're an international star, especially if Jimi Hendrix was breaking down so many barriers, of course, huge mm. barriers. And um, so probably people had so much expectations of him. Like, wow, you're this black rock and roll star. You're like, you know, everybody wants a piece of you. I, I can't imagine what it must have felt like. I can because I, can, I knew his manager yep. who really wanted a piece of him. Right. <laughs> and got it. Uh, and, and you know, you'd walk down the street with him and, and everybody's like, Jimmy, Jimmy. And Jimmy's got to be thinking to himself, well, what's this all about? You know, he, he didn't take his own uh, notoriety as seriously as some other people do. So I think it added to his sense of confusion it, it, I mean, I'm sure there was some appreciation in there as well, obviously. Any, anybody who wants to be 
admired for what they do. But, you know, he had groupies hitting on him 24-7. It just, he found it a bit unnatural, I think. To those of you who want to become rock and roll stars, do it. You know, whatever makes you happy. It's just everybody's got their own view of what's going to tweak their weenie at the end, you know. And mine happens to be laying back a little bit and other people are a bit more forward. I'm not shy particularly, so it's it's just, you know. What were you doing at Art of White Festival? Who were you playing with? Ah, okay. There was a guy called Jerry Brandt who just passed away recently, but he owned the Electric Circus. And at that time, he was managing the Voices of East Harlem. So I was brought on board to be a co-musical director. And it was an amazing experience. He had all these kids from East Harlem, mostly from one church, and they ranged in age from like eight to their late teens and taken care of by a couple of choir masters who were great, you know, these staunch little ladies who really kept everyone in line. What are your memories of the Isle of Wight Festival? I mean, obviously it's legendary with so many incredible performers. I, I mean, it must have been an incredible experience to be able to be backstage and be involved in it all. It was. It really was. It was certainly the biggest festival I've ever been involved with. I remember row after row after row of these WEM column speakers on stage, <laughs> which I think belonged to Floyd. But the sea of faces. I imagine Woodstock was probably somewhat similar in terms of a sea of faces. But it was just enthralling. It was really, really, for lack of a better word, it was wonderful. And we got to do our gospel -y stuff, and people really liked it. So it was great. And I had my first two white knuckle rides on a helicopter because they had to ferry us over from the mainland, and they did it by chopper. Before we get on to Steely Dan, the, it, it, I, are you playing sessions in New York? Is that How do you get to the Steely Dan gig? Was it that, or did the sessions come afterwards? How to just move back slightly back in my history, um, I had a band called Randall's Island. Uh, we were signed to Polydor. We were managed by Stigwood. We wound up touring Europe twice with opening up for John Mayall, who was a total prince. Mayall treated us so well. In fact, at one point, he wound up, since the opening act doesn't make a lot of money. Of course, in these days, the opening act has to pay to do this. But in those days... There was a support act, and they were given, you know, 500 quid a day or whatever. And um, John actually took a pay cut so that Randall's Island could continue on with the tours. Yeah, and he never even told me about it. It wasn't. It was the manager, Rick, that told me about it. So I was like, wow. So John's been a real heck of a mentor and a heck of a friend for many, many years. So Randall's Island, we did our first album. It met with some acclaim, particularly more in Europe than it did in the States, but I'm still very proud of what we did. Um, we did a second album, which was a bit more out there. It was, we were sort of exploring the boundaries. And I think Polydor didn't quite get it. The Stigwas didn't quite get it. So as it turned out, Robert had just bought the rights to Jesus Christ Superstar. This would be 1971. What do we do with Randall's Island? I know, we'll put them in the pit because they're all, they all read, they're all accomplished musicians, blah, blah, blah. Now we wound up in the pit of Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. And it was there that we wound up meeting, I mean, the, the orchestral pit must have had 30 some odd players in it. And some of them were full-time session players during the day. Some of them were contractors or fixers, as they call them over here. And I started getting calls to do session work. Some of it for artists, some of it for jingles. And I thought, gee, I really like this. You know, it was quite challenging. And I'm meeting all these new faces. You know, some of the people that I described earlier, Huey, David Spinoza, those guys. And I'm like, wow, I feel so at home here. By the time 72-ish came around, I was really starting to feel confident in what I did. Um, and it was that year that I moved out to L.A. I, after a year of Superstar, it was like, enough. With all respect to, you know, to Tim and Andrew and all that, it, it, there's only so many shows that you can do where you have to play the same notes for every show. And me wanting to be creative, of course, I got in trouble the whole time because I was <laughs> taking it outside the realms, but there you have it. Um, so I'm, I'm out in L.A. and 
Donald and Walsh get hold of me and say, hey, we hear you're out here. We're doing an album. Would you come and play? Well, my obvious response was, sure. You know, when should I show up and where do I go to? So it was Village Recorders. It was some, I don't even remember what the what season it was, although I suspect it was spring or summer. Um, and I walk in the studio. This is the first session I did for them, which is reeling in the years. And nice way to start. It was a lovely way to start. <laughs> of course, I did. I used to do demos for them back in New York on some of their earlier material. So we know each other from um, being in the backing band for Jay and the Americans. Oh, so they were both. They were both in the backing band with you. That's right. And funny enough, I mean, I always respected them because they, gee, these guys are like very special. And they must have thought I was special too because we bonded. And in the studio bonding that night, it was really wild because they came in, they said, here's the song, we'll play it down for you once. I listened to it, I thought, oh, that's really nice. Um, and then I said, can you give me a set of lyrics? Do you have them around? Let me see what it is that I'm playing to. By that time, I had already adopted the idea of it's best to know what the mood of the song is before you set your own musical tapestry. I read the words. Hmm. Okay, let's run it through once more. And um, we did. And I dare say it was it was a pretty exciting take. And Gary Katz went to the assistant and said, did he get that? Well, no, it was just a run through. And Gary goes, oh, no. All right, let's do another one. So the second take, which is really the first recorded take, was literally the take that we did that you hear in its entirety. It was just something got me going. I mean, the, the intro, that it's just a takeoff on, on the chorus, right? It's just like what a jazz saxophonist would play, you know, at the intro to something he had just heard. And then the answers to the various bits, you know, were all in there. Um, and all the way to the end. And we stopped the take and it was like, that's it. Nobody said, can we try it again? So I was delighted. They were happy. And, you know, you hear what you hear. It's, it's, uh, I'm still very, very proud of it today. The whole bridge section seems like it was designed for the guitar to be featured. In a ah. Okay, yeah. here's the surprise. That part's actually written. I, I was wondering, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was actually performed by Denny, not myself. Ah. Ah. Uh, and there's this wonderful perfectness to what he's doing. It's yeah, absolutely yeah. perfect. I was, yeah, I was wondering about that. So, so let's, let's talk about it, though, because, you, you know, um, I'm reading the quote here verbatim. Um, you know, Jimmy Page says it's his favorite guitar solo of all time. Which must be That's quite a nice, <laughs> quite a nice compliment, to say the least. It is. It is indeed. <laughs> it, it is one of the most expressive guitar solos I think ever performed. It, it, it's it's one of the most instant songs I think um, for me as well. It's such a complete song. You're saying it's the second take you, you did. Do you attribute that to great ear development that you can pick up the chorus melody, put it into the intro? Is that something you pride yourself on, you know, as a, as a guitar player, having a great ear and really being in the song? I think my, my skills are reasonable. Um, <laughs> but no, see, I'm, I'm not being modest. I mean, but the song virtually played itself. You know, it, there was something about it that made it. And, and in terms of the, 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 the music, the changes, it's actually quite simple. It's a flat, 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 uh, flat seven chord major to a one, repeat, 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 and up to a six chord, then it repeats again. And then the, the verses become somewhat different. But the, the stuff that I was doing actually, technically and theoretically, I was playing against stuff that wasn't all that demanding. I mean, all that might be demanded is the amount of taste that you put in and and of course, as someone who now looks at the you know the umbrella down from the top of the umbrella, it, it's got to a not interfere with with anything else that's going on. It's got to complement it, and it needs to be within a certain range. And I, I could have played too high, I could have played too low, but somehow on this session, I wound up playing what everybody thought was 
everything you know being what they wanted. So that makes me a happy guy. The syncopation that of of the part is the way the solo comes in is just so beautiful. You know, you said earlier that you don't you listen to bebop, but you don't consider yourself that kind of player. But it definitely has a a, a, a jazzier feel, as it were. It does, but you know, some of it also is is a salsa feel. Right. I was I played with a bunch of different salsa feels, and the way they syncopate stuff, which is very jazzy indeed. You know, it's it turning the beat <clears throat> just on its side. You know, doing some sort of couple of notes that make you go, "Huh? Wait a second. You know, all those little things became incorporated subconsciously, but that's how it worked. Yeah. I just love that bow that that bow da, 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 da. and then yeah, then I don't, yeah. I don't know why I did it. You know, I just did it because <laughs> it was it was what came to me. And that's one of the beauties if 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 nobody's sticking a sheet of paper up in front of you and saying, play this, which is fine also. It's the ability for somebody to it's it's someone giving you license to do what you think would be appropriate. So there's no instructions. And it's it's the way I prefer to work the most. So uh, on the geekiness, um, do you remember the guitar? Oh. The yes, amp? yes. Give a little little uh, the geeky oh, that's, questions. That's easy. That's easy because most people get it wrong. It was my number one Fender Strat, which by that time I had already put the humbucking pickup in the front. Gibson still humbucker. have it. Wow. Still number one. Still number one. So so what what pickup is that? What is that a gift? Uh, Gibson humbucker? Okay, so this is an old, this was put in 1969 by the Barney Kessel Guitar Shop in LA. Wow. So I thought it was a PAF, but I did my research and it was slightly after that, so they had the patent already. Yeah. This is a Zex Coil pickup. How'd you spell that? Z E X C O I L. The guy who invents these things is a gentleman called Scott Lawing. And He's got something very, very special happening in terms of his ears, his understanding of electronics. He's a guitarist himself, and uh, he just makes these beautiful, beautiful pickups. When did you put um, that pickup in? Uh, when I first met him, which would probably be, out, be about four or five years ago. Before that pickup, I had a DiMarzio stacked humbucker, which was interesting because it was... It didn't have a lot of personality, um, and it it was sort of perfect for those parts that wanted the guitar not to have a lot of personality. So it was actually quite utilitarian. So this 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 Zex coil it can do that, but it's also a lot more high fidelity, and as such, it just gives me a whole another piece of a palette to work with on the guitar. In fact, a number of my guitars have Zex calls on them. I have another 63 Strat, which is all three Zex coils. And then I've got this beauty here. This is my Music Man Albert Lee model. Yeah, I recognize it. That's beautiful. So there, there are two different configurations you can get. One of them is with the three pickups a la Strat, or you can get them with two pickups a la El, you know, Gibson-esque. Right. So obviously this is the one that I got. And uh, I had Scott make me, he's got a new pickup now for you really geeky guitar wizards. Um, he, um, it's, it's a three way pickup. It's a single coil. It's a double coil and it's a P90. Now I've always loved, yeah, I've loved the sound of P90s forever, but I always had a problem with them buzzing. And what he's done is all of these pickups are totally noise canceling. And it's not the typical humbucker way. He's got his own scientific way of, of making them. He doesn't call them humbucking. He calls them noise canceling. And, uh, and they do, you know. And it's just the P90s are so glassy sounding and just beautiful, really beautiful. So the is that... Is that the neck that you had on in those days? Because I don't see. Well, funny, geez, funny you should ask. <laughs> the, I bought this 63 in 1965. And um, 
for those of you collectors, you can eat your hearts out because it cost me one hundred and seventy five dollars <laughs> used. Um, I broke the first neck. I stuck it in the boot in the trunk of um, of my friend's Triumph Spitfire. We got to the gig and it was in a soft case. So we get to the gig and the case is going like, oh, and completely gone. So I had Jimmy's Music Store, who was the Fender dealer in New York, order me another neck, another neck, which cost a whopping seventy-five dollars. What year was this? Sixty-five. So it's a sixty-five neck on a sixty-three body. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, and it's magical. I mean, I put on these Gibson bass frets, and they must be made out of kryptonite because I've had them on here since nineteen seventy-two, for real. <laughs> You know, uh, every now and then a, a slight grind and polish, and uh, that's it. You know, I have a wonderful luthier here, up, uh, actually up in Richmond, in, in uh, North Yorkshire, who does all my guitars, and he's just who, Who's your luthier? His name is Nigel Stockbridge. That's a good name. That's a good <laughs> English name, isn't good it? Good English name, yes. <laughs> I see no logo on the headstock, though. No, and that's because... I did something really stupid in 1965 play, when I played the um, Tony Martz opposite the, the opposite the band or what was to become the band. My bass player and I had sprayed our guitars silver flake metal, a silver flake. I'm sorry, metal flake silver, and uh, and that went for the head as well. I see. So when I decided to bring it down to wood. Obviously, the logo was gone. I've been offered logos, and I thought, no, this is this is the way it's been. You know, keep it Mr. Natural. Has Fender ever done a, a, a custom shop uh, version for you? No, I've always stayed away from doing those those sorts of um, you know personalized models. Um, I don't think there's anything that very much that I could bring to the ball game, other than somebody saying, "Well, these are the pickups he's using." Here you go. Putting wide frets on in those days was. Uh pretty unheard of. I mean, it's now pretty standard for the, the, the sort of super strats to have the big fat jumbo frets and stuff mm. like that. What what made you do it? Just a hunch. Literally just a hunch. I wonder what these will be like. Because uh, I have very, very light strings. On this guitar, and I say, I say that specifically because other guitars I use different string gauges. On this, I use a 009, an 010, an 013. So if you think about it, those are really like you can blow on them and they'll they'll bend. So nine, ten, thirteen are for the E, B, and G. Yes, yes. And then it gets heavier. It goes to like twenty six or twenty eight, thirty eight, forty eight. So I get a a bigger, fatter sound on the bottom. But the thing about the the lighter strings on the top is I can bend up a fourth with like no problem. So it allows me to be that much more expressive. You know, just on, on, on the spur of the moment. And this happened in, when, in 1963. I was playing at the, the, the Cafe Bazaar, you know, like I said, with Richie Havens and all that. And uh, I was also backing up the Ronettes at the time, which was a very Incredible. interesting experience. Yeah. Um, but I met a, um, a really, really good country guitarist who was bending like crazy. And this is before I understood about the lighter strings. And he said, well, here's what you got to do. You get yourself a nine, which is a banjo string. And in those days, you couldn't get nines with ball ends. So you had to cannibalize an old ball end to slip it through. And then he said, and then you use the first string for the second string and the second string for the third string. And that's what gave me the magic that I still use today on this instrument. Other instruments, I'll use heavier strings. But this one, I love the lightness of it. And it allows me to be that much more expressive. That's beautiful. And do you still use those string gauge to this day? Oh, wow. And just for pure geekdom, what manufacturer of strings? Well, these days, I'm using Roto Sounds. Because you are in the UK, so good on exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, they hit on me and they said, would you like to try our strings? And I said, sure. Lovely. And uh, I tried them and I really liked them. Interestingly enough, I think... The string development has come a long way in the last 10 years where I've put on a number of different kinds of strings and really liked virtually all of the ones that I've tried. Uh, so we've got these, 
Ernie Ball makes some great strings. And funny enough, I used to really not relate to Ernie Ball strings. But these days, they're like, wow, you know, they're full of life. They last a long time. Uh, I was for many years a Diodario endorser. And I still use their strings on my acoustic. I have a, a beautiful old Martin D D28 that I absolutely adore. I've had it since the 70s. So it's had a chance to really mature. Um, but yeah, I mean, and there's a couple other string makers, perhaps of less renown, who make strings that are just as good. And sadly, in MI, you know, you, you, you find a brand is there one year and it's not there, there the next year. So I've got a couple of boxes of dozens of strings from string makers who aren't around anymore. So it would be senseless for me even to say who they are. But, you know, they're really good. But uh, uh, in those days when you tracked reeling in the years, it was Ernie Balls. Is that correct? No, those would have been uh, Diodarios. Oh, Diodarios back in, uh, yeah. in 72. 72, correct? yeah. 72. Yeah. Ah. And in those days, I really thought they were the best strings. I mean, and I had gone through all sorts of different, you know, manufacturers, varieties, and just loved them. And uh, any, so amp, what amp were you using in those days? Ah. On that track, more specifically. Okay. On that track, I came to the studio, and unlike New York studios, where they have two or three amps for anybody to plug into, Village had no amps. None, zero. You had to bring your own. So, oh, what am I going to do? It turns out, there was a storeroom next door to the, to the studio itself. And the only big amp they had there was an Ampeg SVT, a billion watts and eight 10 inch speakers. Yeah. <laughs> Roger Nichols, the engineer, and I, we just sort of looked at each other as, as we were rolling this thing in. And go, oh dear. Well, let's make the best of it. What the heck? You know? And we did. It was just the guitar, cable, amplifier. That was it. There's no effects. Yeah, a lot of people think I used a fuzz tone, but it was actually us overdriving the crap out of that Ampeg amp. It must have been so loud to get that tone. Oh, it was. It was. It was <laughs> full up. It was full up. It was, if there had been an 11, it would have been on 11. But I remember Roger sort of walking in there to place the mic and he said, oh, hold it a second. Went back and got a pair of, you know, it looked like jet phones and uh, placed this one 414 just where he thought it ought to be. And that was it. That was the sound. Was it a large live room so you could just crank the schnizzle? No, it, w it, wasn't, it wasn't hugely large. It mm. wasn't small, but it was, you know, a medium-sized room. But uh, he was able to just pull that sound out of a hat. I must say that I've used some software simulations of that amp um, yep. to try to recreate that sound. And it comes a little bit close. But what he was capturing really was the whole, the vibrations of the cabinet, the vibrations of the room. You know, there was something about the way he placed that mic. He was, he was the most special engineer ever. So, you know, he just understood stuff innately. How much did they tracked by that stage? Was it, you said that you had a lyric sheet, but there was no lyrics. Generally on Steely Dan records, I'm, if not the last, and certainly one of the last to play. Which is a shame because I really enjoy playing rhythm guitar, but right. you know, time and space and whoever is where, it's one of those. Why do you think the solo has become so famous? I know it must be quite a um, strange question to ask you directly since you played it. Well, what indeed, indeed. And I think I have to play the modest card here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a good song. That's a great song. Yeah, yeah. It's a really catchable song. The lyrics are relatable. Uh, everything about it, uh, other than its length, which the record company freaked out about, uh, was perfect. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that I got to grace pieces of that, um, the fact that pieces of what I did have become embraced as being part of the song, you know, what more could you ask for? I remember listening to it for the first time with a friend of mine, James Gordon. And he said to me, he goes, it sounds like, jazz rock beach boys and i was like what's wrong with that it sounds like you know what i mean the harmonies come in you've got the beach boys sure but then you've got some jazz in it and then you've got some rock in it i'm like 
that's that sounds great to me. It sounds like all the things we love. <laughs> well, I think I think it took a lot of people a long time. I mean, obviously, not everybody, because they became quite big after the first album. But uh, it, it it was over the heads of a lot of people, and you can't blame them. I mean, what were they listening to before? You know, and this was an excursion into a land that I can't think of any other band having tread that course. I think Steely Dan, they obviously was all about incredible musicianship and incredible production, but they had that one ingredient that most people that play music like this miss, and that's great songwriting. Because it's all very well being incredible musicians and having the best production ever, but if the songs are just showing off those skills only, then it's only musicians that listen to it. But like I said, you know, my son's a big fan. And he, I did not play it to him. He came to me one day and said, hey, Dad, do you know this? And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> I, I'm so I proud. It. I was so proud. <laughs> I love it. So anecdotally about Please. Steely Dan and their writing, when we were doing the demos in New York, uh, and we were being produced by Kenny Vance, who was one of Jane the Americans, Kenny took his stuff, or Kenny and Donald and Walter took their stuff, to virtually every music publisher and every record company in New York City. And they got, I won't say laughed at, but they certainly got turned down by everybody. And it wasn't until Gary Katz, who was in that same circle, took some demos out to LA and played them for ABC Dunhill president at the time, who Wasn't quite sure, but he saw that there was something there. So he said, I'll hire them as writers. Nice. And that was how it started. You know, they they, they were sitting there writing for a while, and they said, well, let's do some tracks. And the next thing you know, Steely Dan was born. So it was quite accidental in in, in certain ways. Let's talk about some other songs that you played with them. Oh, good, okay. There's Throwback the Little Ones from Katie Lied. Ah, Your recollections of that. Here's an interesting little lesson for... Some people, a lot of people will understand anyway. But um, this was done at a time where I wasn't actually expecting to record for them. I happened to be in L.A. while they were recording Katie Lloyd. And once again, I was invited. This time, I didn't have a guitar with me. (laughs) So I wound up borrowing Denny's guitar, which was a Telecaster. And... I dare anybody to, to, to find any sort of tonal difference between that performance and any of the other musics that I recorded for them. Because it's not the guitar. It's really the player and the sensibilities of the engineer and, and all that. Oh, and the other thing about Throwback the Little Ones is really interesting. It's the only time that I ever used a chart to play on a Steely Dan track. And the reason for that is that they had... Um, orchestrated it with horns. You'll recall there's this whole, you know, trumpet, trumpet, sax thing going on. And again, being, if not possibly one of the last people to play, the horns were already laid down. And Donald and Walter said, okay, we want you to play here, but then when we get to this part, I want you to double the horns and then move on to the rest of your solo. So it was like, okay, okay, and then so it was really quite the challenge. And it, it wasn't easy reading either, but it was fun. It was really, really fun. And the Telecaster was standard pickups? I doubt it. I doubt it. Because, you know, Jeff had always been quite the fiddler right. with electronics. And I suspect that he actually rewired that telly. Sorry, was it Jeff's Was it Jeff's guitar or Denny's? He had- no, it was Denny's rewired by Jeff. Ah. <laughs> It gets very incestuous, you know. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally understand. I totally understand. Mm. Oh, and then, of course, both uh, Sign In Stranger and Green Earrings. Oh, both a God, royal that, scam. That was fun. That was just plain fun. Um, Sign In Stranger has a beautiful dialogue between Donald's vocals, Paul Griffin's piano, and then my responses to Paul Griffin's piano. So if you listen to it and sort of focus on those three instruments, you'll hear a really cool set of interactions. 
it's quite humorous actually. It's beautiful. And then and then the other again, you know, being given the latitude to just do what I felt, I had this beautiful old Mutron biphase. Oh, nice. Um, which I plugged in and didn't use until the fade. <laughs> but when I plugged it in, it, it just sort of became from the bubbling mass, you know, using both yeah. phasers independently. And it was just so much fun. And do you have recollections of the guitar you were using on that? Were you back to your Strat? Oh, that would have been Strat, yeah. On both Everything songs? else was the Strat. Everything else was the Strat. There's one where you left out, which is Kings. Of course, yeah. Truly one of my favorite tracks. And the reason it is, is because I got to go so far out there. They just let me go. Um, and I was going through some very, very strange life experiences at the time. Uh, I was on the verge of a divorce and things were just a little out of kilter. And I thought to myself, why don't I just play my schizophrenia? <laughs> Which is exactly what I did. I mean, if you listen, some parts are really quite in with the track and other parts go like way out. There's this descending whole tone scale that I do that's like, what the hell does that have to do with it? But it all seems to work together. I'm not tooting my own horn. It was just, it was coincidence. You know, it was pure whatever happened. I think, I, I think one of the things that's truly remarkable um, is there must have been some massive camaraderie that you, you, you're able to come in and play solos on albums that have Skunk Baxter and Danny Dias, you know, playing on. I mean, that's just, that's no, there's no lack of ego. There's, there's no ego there. It's just about like, hey, let's make great that's, music. That's very true. Back Beautiful. then, I mean, we had, we had really fast friendships. We hung out with each other a lot, um, had musical experiences, had just social experiences. And there wasn't really a hint of competition. To me, I didn't, I didn't feel that at all. There right. are other situations that you can wind up in where people are looking to gun you down, you know. Like what? Um, <laughs> well, I remember, this isn't recording, this is live playing, but um, I was doing a tribute. I think Stevie Ray Vaughan had just passed. And we had a, a do for him at the um, Lone Star Roadhouse in New York. And yeah, you know, there's a bunch of us up on stage. We're playing and we're playing. And um, Cornell Dupree was up there with me. And Cornell taps me on the shoulder. He says, look over there, over to the bottom of stage left. And there's easily half a dozen guys with guitar cases. <laughs> he said, look at him. They're just looking to shoot us down. Just looking to shoot us down. And I think he was right. I think that was the vibe. You know, but it was, it's never supposed to be about shooting somebody down. It's supposed to be about picking every pick, picking each other up and finding the heights, you know. So the competitive stuff, when I hear people talk about Battle of the Bands even, I go, Arr! because to me, it's it's not about competing. You know, I see some of these game shows and, or, or contests or whatever, and I go, no, there shouldn't be a winner. They're all winners. They're all out there doing their thing. So here's, here's a big one. You've declined joining bands, one of yes. which, of course, is Steely Dan. Toto um, comes up in conversation as a band that offered you a job. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, um, obviously, Jeff Procaro, you know, I'm assuming you've just all met and because of, of, of working together with Steely Dan and other projects. Um, mm -hmm. Do you like being free to kind of work on other stuff? What, what was your decision? Or, was you it... could just, or you could just say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm thinking uh, about that. No, when I'm you kidding. I'm earlier kidding. said about when Jimmy died, when Jimi Hendrix died, that you weren't, you didn't really want to be the rock star, but you definitely wanted mm. to play music. And do you, did you, do you feel like being in a band would have tied you to one project too much? Well, here's the story. After having been in a number of bands, some of them successful interpersonally or business-wise or both, some of them less, um, I came to the conclusion, for whatever it's worth, that most bands are uh, dysfunctional families. Right. And that somewhere along the line, there's going to be very, very painful... Uh, 
disagreements, fights, arguments, breakups. And from my days with C Train, I remember this is back in 69, uh, we had to get rid of the lead singer. And it was a very, very painful process because someone's your friend, but you're in the band and you can't say, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to stay with the band. I'm going to leave the band. I'm going to go with my friend. It was really difficult. And the same thing was true with Randall's Island, where our first bass player, um, for reasons we don't have to get into, wound up not being in the band. But again, very, very painful. This was 1971. Um, and since then, I've always felt like, well, if I have the opportunity to record with somebody, great. If I have the opportunity to play live with somebody, great. If, or both, great. But not to tie a very important lifeline to something that may or may not go awry. So, um, I mean, Toto was probably the one band that I, when I look back on, I might have made a mistake. Because <laughs> I loved Percaro and Page, and, you know, there was just this lovely bond um, that we had. But I said no. Um, the Blues Brothers, that's another example. That's um, Belushi and I were good friends because I used to work on Saturday Night Live. And... I had him come in to do a track for me, singing for me. And uh, at the end of the session, he said, uh, Elliot, would you like to be the musical director of the Blues Brothers? And I thought, and I thought. And these are days that we were really abusing substances in really dumb amounts. And I thought to myself, if I say yes, I'm probably going to die. So I respectfully said to him, why don't you get Paul Schaefer to do it? <laughs> um, and thank you anyway. And the, the very, very sad thing about it is that the day that John and I were supposed to have lunch together at the Chateau Marmont back in 81 or 82 was the day that he died. So in essence, part of it proved true. You know, and I don't mean to be somebody who goes, oh, drugs, you know, although I've tamed myself down quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll smoke the occasional reefer. And that, that's, that's all I need, you know? Um, or let the music get me high, which is even better. It was just, uh, I, I couldn't do it, you know? Um, the Doobie Brothers, same thing. And I loved playing with the Doobie Brothers. It was the most amazing experience. I never recorded with them, but I did a lot of live playing. They would, They'd pick me up in New York and I'd fly with them for a week or two to various venues in America and then come back to New York just because it made me feel great. You know, it was, there was nothing else to it. It wasn't about money and it wasn't about adulation. It was just about feeling really, really good. And um, even there, as it reached the end of its sort of second incarnation, it got a bit touch and go. And it really broke my heart, you know? I mean, it didn't affect me directly in terms of playing, but it was like, mm, no, I can't do this. So I'm not, I'm not at all uh, bothered by not having Fantastic. Yep. said yes. That's great. So if we it get back to the, um, the Blues Brothers, that's, mm. um, that's such an important movie. I don't... I, from what I've read about it, and obviously being a fan, and mm. uh, um, and I and I would go and see the Blues Brothers band in the eighties when they mm. toured with Steve Cropper, and it, oh, it was so amazing. Donald Duck Dunn. I remember being a kid and getting backstage and getting all their autographs. I mean, it's huge, but such an important record um, because, and you know this better than me. I, I want to ask you about this because. Um, you you know those guys went to bat with the, both the movie company and the record companies about using these classic R and B and soul singers, and they were yes. adamant the, the the film people and the record company people that they use more current stars. Um, but I think personally speaking, if it wasn't for the fact that those guys went back and got Aretha and got all of these and Ray Charles in there, I don't know if. 
generations to come would have really you know been introduced in such a huge way such an important movie for me so anyway sorry that big diatribe but it must have been so exciting to work on it i think you're right warren i think i think that there's an importance to that movie that is still finding its historical place and that is to say they introduced dare i say hundreds of thousands if not millions of people to artists they would not have heard before. Yep. And so um, the record companies didn't do themselves a favor by by saying, don't do it. Uh, but that's record companies, isn't it? It just wound up being really the smart thing to do. And it was all a bunch of fun guys. I still, I mean, I haven't for the last year, but when they come to London to play, you know, the jazz cafe, not to, the, um, to play at Ronnie Scott's, I'm always there. Always there to support and, and love them and give them cuddles and the whole works, you know, because I love them all. They're great guys. They're really, really great guys. Uh, well, there was an energy. They had yeah. an energy. That was very, very special. Amazing. Especially John and Dan. I mean, John and Dan really put everybody right as far as their ultra-heavy vibes. They were such strong men, you know. So what can you tell us about the sessions? I wound up doing two dates for the record. Uh, Bob Tischler was producing, and he was, you know, a big deal with the Saturday Night Live crowd. Um, and they were really cool recordings. Um, one of them was Give Me Some Lovin', and another was some old Elvis tune, I think. And as it turned out, they weren't in the movie. They were only put onto the album. I guess they needed more space to fill up the 40 minutes for, you know, for vinyl or whatever. And then when I wound up going to realizing that I wasn't being paid for, you know, performance royalties, I went to the union and said, hey, where's my money? And after about two years of back and forth, and they said, well, actually, since it's not in the movie, you can't get paid for it. So, okay. You know, things like this happen from time to time, and you got to be prepared to go. Eh. Uh, give me some loving. Um Absolutely incredible um, song from the from the Blues Brothers soundtrack. Like, did, was it the same thing you were saying? You came in at the end, and what did, what did they have you do? Uh, they basically said, "Play away," you know. Fantastic. Um, Tischler was it was a very easy producer to work with. Wonderful. Uh, I think he just wanted to take his time. You know, where I think I could have been done in an hour and a half, but we were there for six hours. So okay, you know, it's, it's that's part of being a professional. Is meeting the task full on. Is it the trusty strat that's that's uh, pretty much with you at all times? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are very few, relatively speaking, recordings that I've done on electric guitar that haven't involved the strat. Perhaps more so recently, given that I've got a, a broader palette of, of instruments to use. But um, I remember going to some jingle date back in the 70s and the guy wanted a Telecaster, really wanted a Telecaster. I said, well, all I've got is my Strat here. He said, well, that's no good. I said, give me a minute. And I pulled out, I think it was an MXR uh, graphic equalizer. And I rolled a lot of the top up and a lot of the bass off. And the next thing you know, it was a Strat, it was a Telecaster. You know, there are so many ways to achieve a sound, especially when you're, playing within a track that don't necessitate the real deal. As long as you can simulate it properly, it's fine. I used to have really bad feeling, feelings about even some of the, the plugins, the earlier guitar plugins, guitar amp plugins. And um, of course they've improved over the years, but now I feel perfectly fine about just, you know, putting up a Pro Tool session and choosing either the IK Media or the GTR from Waves. And they both supply me with virtually every amp I could possibly want. And if I can't get it, I've got some amps over here that will do me just fine. Did you have a favorite amp in those days? Did you? Yes. Okay, what was the yes. favorite amp? Um, well, in 1960, I bought a brown Tolex Fender Concert amp with four 10-inch Oxford speakers. I, but I very, very foolishly sold it once I got a Fender Super Reverb amp, also with four 10s, 
The difference being this one had reverb and the other one didn't. Uh, I could just kick myself every time I think about having sold it because it was such a beautiful amp. And then when I was a C train in 69, our roadie built me up an amp made up out of three different super reverbs. He cannibalized them. It turned out to be a really marvelous sounding amp. And I used that really until I left New York City, which was 1999 or so. Um, it since it it fell into incredible disrepair. It was sitting in my guitar tech's basement, and he wound up being very ill and got mm. a little damp. And but you know you can't cry over spilt milk. They got there's lots of new great amps out there, and as long as I'm really happy with the sound, I can have I can have really warm memories of that super. But I move on. It's beautiful. The this, this super wasn't wasn't it also a Roy Buchanan favorite as well. Probably. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of guitarists liked it. I think because it had 10-inch speakers rather than 12s. And the 10s get rid of that woofy sound that some of the guitar pickups will give you. And you just get a more direct, in-your-ear sort of sound. Again, it's totally up to the player. I would never, ever say to somebody, you're stupid, you got 12-inch speakers. You know, if, if it turns you on, use it. These days, do you have a favorite amp that, uh, you know, for playing live? Yeah, yeah, I do, actually. It's sitting right here. It's a Hughes and Kettner Deluxe 20. So believe it or not, it's all of 20 amps, 20 watts. And I run it through. I had High Watt build me a, a really, really nice cabinet. And I outfitted it with a couple of speakers the names of which escape me at the moment. Uh, but it sounds great. It doesn't sound dissimilar to my Super other than the actual amplitude, the RMS that it'll put out. So, and again, if, if you're in any sort of a good situation, there'll be a mic on it anyway. And if you have a good uh, monitor mixer, everything's fine. So I use that. Um, I had tons of... Um, I still do. I've got cupboards full of, of uh, foot pedals. And sometimes I'll use a very particular one for a very particular purpose. Electroharmonics makes some great ones. Um, I still have three Mutron biphases, which I absolutely love. But if I'm going to a gig, I'm going to make it pretty simple for myself. So rather than have a full pedal board, I will use this little baby. Which Who's that? is a TC... TC Electronic. Yep. Not very expensive. I don't think they make them anymore. A Nova, it's called. A TC Nova. TC was bought out by Behringer, so I don't know what to say about that. Um, but it covers virtually all of the effects that I would need. It's got really nice fuzz, really nice compression, really crystalline reverb, delays, modulation. The whole works. And you can set up all sorts of presets. So I bring, so I basically bring a small amp, that little guy, and and a guitar, and I'm fine. And again, no offense to people with big pedal boards. I've even got a, a medium sized pedal board, which I love. Sure. But I just don't take it out that much. Well, I don't. I have again. I have not having been on stage in a year. I do remember having a pedal board that was like. The, mm, it, people sure. people used to ask me if I was a keyboard player because they thought I had a huge keyboard case and it was like <laughs> I'd open it up and it had like 40 pedals crammed on there. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the problems that I've always had with that though is trying to figure out what to use because you've got so many options. So if you cut your options down, it makes it easier for me to make a reasonably informed choice. The only live experiences that I've had that I really cherish where when i was performing with the doobie brothers we had a front of house engineer called gray ingram who was also one of ssl's big brain guys for a number of years and gray had all the outboard effects that we might think about using directly patched into his console so when we would do it wasn't the guitar players doing it. It was the it was the mixing engineer. You know, or when there was a complete phase over the entire mix. You know, these things that a really creative engineer can do. Right. 
Nothing can be replaced like that. So look, I don't know where to start um, with the sessions because, you know, I've got any anecdotes. My question, I'm sure you saw it, was any anecdotes from other sessions with major artists you did, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Peter Frampton. I got, I got one good anecdote for you. When we were recording with Yoko, we had this really, really band of strong men, you know, in terms of attitude, right? It was um, myself and Johnny Chorpe on guitars, Yogi Horton, R.I.P. on drums, Paul Griffin on keyboards, Rubens Bassini from Brazil 66 on percussion. And we're all gathered there, you know, Testosterone City, beginning of the day, probably 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, gathered in the studio, just hanging about. And in walks petite little Yoko. And she looks at us and she smiles and she says, good morning, ladies. <laughs> and... Talk about breaking the ice. It was <laughs> unbelievable. We were all just in stitches. <laughs> so, and that's sort of the way, that's, that's a good way to handle people. You know, you, you, you tell something inoffensive that will make people laugh, that will make people feel at ease. And that's, that's the key to doing a good session, to producing yeah. a good session. As a producer, um, my probably favorite producer, although I probably got half a dozen, the one that comes to mind is Joel Dorn, who produced some of Roberta Flack's biggest hits. He did the last six or seven Russ on Roland Kirk records. He was a guy who was literally tone deaf. You know, you'd sing him an A and he'd sing you a, an E flat. Was that it? <laughs> yeah. And he was completely deaf in one ear. I'd go over and start shouting in one ear and he'd go, Elliot, other ear. <laughs> Uh, but this guy understood how to make a record. He would simply hire the best people or sometimes hire a contractor who would hire the best people for that particular piece of music and then just create vibes, you know, whether it's incense or a vial of some silly stuff or whatever. We all had it to hand. And in the course of the evening, we were able to just naturally make music. There was nobody there on an ego trip. You know, it was all about love and peace and let's make some really great music today. You know, there were two, there were two emerging engineers in 1969 yep. that I had the extreme pleasure of working with. And they were at A&R, Elliot Shiner. Amazing. And at Record Plant with Jay. And they were just, so cool to work with. And we were all literally growing up together. You know, so. Did you ever work with Shelley? Yakis? Yeah. Of course. Shelley's another course. one of my good friends. Such a sweetheart. I'll send him my love. The last time I saw him, he had just moved to LA doing the A&M thing. So you would have been on the Milk and Honey. That's right. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. Uh, which is a great record. I see some amazing names on this. Um, mm. Obviously, Hugh, you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Andy Newmark on drums. Mm. Oh, incredible. Earl Slick, of course, playing guitar yeah. as well. I mean, it's just a who's who of, the, of, of just New York's incredible session players. Carlos Alomar is singing backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's how those sessions went. Everything was like... <laughs> You know, right up in the air, bananas, everything was great. When I think of New York from an English perspective, a UK perspective growing up, I always think of Saturday Night Live. I always think of like, that's the stylized, artsy version of New York that I remember. I remember my parents would stay up late. I can't remember what time it was. You have to ask your wife. I'm sure she'll remember what time it was on in, in the UK. But I think it was at like midnight. It was definitely... Kids were not allowed to watch it. It was on super late right. and my parents would always watch it and I would sneak and just poke my head through the door and watch like oh, Chevy man. Chase and like, and there's, and there's just something about it. And the records that were being made in the late seventies and early eighties so exemplified that, you know, New York's New York sound. I'm obviously Jack yes. with double fantasy, but milk and honey as well, just has this sort of sophistication and, worldliness to it that I absolutely love. I mean, what a blessing to be in, in that scene at that time. It, it was the best. It was absolutely the best. I mean, I did enjoy LA a lot, but New York was this heartbeat of American music, you know, and it was all kinds of music. 
everything from symphonic to, you know, people playing kazoos. But we had something going for us. Perhaps it was because everybody wanted to record in New York, although other people wanted to record in L.A. But there was a, a combination of dozens and dozens of incredible recording studios, musicians galore. You couldn't, I mean, you, you could shake a stick and hit 12 musicians on any street. It was just wonderful. Let's sort of go back to, to, to year zero. What, what are sort of your earliest memories of, of playing guitar? Where do they come in fondly? Let me think. It really as my dad brought home a guitar for me when I was nine years old. Wow. This is after I had tried playing piano. I, I was taking piano lessons from the age of five. And I had a god awful teacher. Really, really awful. I mean, she would literally, if you're not holding your hands right, she would take out a ruler and slap you with it. So <laughs> sorry. It wasn't a good a good way to, to get into this art form. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, long story short, even with her brutality, I, I didn't really last long with her. But my mom worked in a uh, in a building where they had an old pump organ, and sometimes she would take me into work with her if I wasn't going to school you know, at school, and I just loved the sounds that it was making. So it my music lust really wasn't quenched, um, and then when I got the guitar, it was just magical. Uh, it was an old Stella. Back in in 1956, <sighs> that was the guitar. I have a Stella. Are you looking for yours? Yeah, my Stella acoustic. <laughs> I hope the action on yours is better than the action on mine. Because it, <laughs> it was after some very serious. Scott Baxendale, a wonderful guitar maker, oh, had great. it rebraced and and lowered it and steamed the neck straight. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's definitely a piece of work but what is wonderful about those guitars um is that they're, they're a solid top so even though they're cheap they're actually quite good quality woods indeed indeed and in those days you know they would have gone for like fourteen dollars ninety nine or something yeah it would i mean you look back at prices it's astounding yeah but was your dad a musician because what why was he bringing home guitars i mean that i wouldn't imagine that's the average dad to bring home a guitar right. for a nine-year-old that's true but my dad actually was a was an aspiring musician. He played uh, woodwinds, mostly alto and tenor, and uh, was a lovely singer as well. But he didn't have the. It, it's hard to find the word. I don't want to say courage because that's not the right word. Mm -hmm. But family dynamics were such that he wound up going back into his family's business, which was a laundry business, and you know. For better or worse, I think he really regretted it, but he was able to at least, thankfully, take a bit of pride in the, some of my earlier accomplishments. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah, um, and my mom was a was a, a, a hobbyist at the piano, but you know, there would I'd, I'd always hear her practicing a bit of Chopin and a bit of this and a bit of that. So there would my my dad was into big band, so I had these two very disparate sets of sounds coming at me from different rooms, which in a sense really helped me eventually appreciate the vast landscape or soundscape, if you will, that exists. So you've answered to me what your first guitar was, of course, the Stella. Who, who has it inspired you outside of obviously your parents playing music? Who, who were the first musicians that you heard that inspired you to play guitar? Ah, okay. So I would have to go back to my teachers first. First guitar instructor was a guy called Billy Syker, whom I didn't know from Adam, really. Um, but he used to teach out of his garage in Queens. And um, I'd go once a week. And he must have been very good because the first year, especially on Estella, you know, it's a bit of a problem. You know, your fingers are almost ready to bleed and <laughs> it's just, it, it can be disheartening. So he must have done something to keep my interest up. And the sort of anecdote at the end of all that is at one point I was talking with a couple of producers for whom I was working, doing some advertising work. And we were talking about, you know, backgrounds and teachers. And they said, well, who was your first teacher? And I said, Bill Syker. And I went, Billy Syker, he used to work for us all the time. And these guys produced tons and tons of hits in the late 50s and early 60s. Wow. So, you know, Bill never mentioned any of that. He was simply there to facilitate the student. 
How wonderful That's is incredible. that? Eric is handing me something. Oh, that's a beauty. Yep, stellar acoustic. <laughs> oh, that's that's fantastic. Yep. Looks a lot nicer than the one that I had, I must say. <laughs> this is an old sort of tobacco sunburst. Oh, that's uh, lovely. I love the tobacco sunburst as well. I, 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 have a, I have another one, but it's a Harmony, even though it's the same company, yeah. Speaking of Harmony, um, my next teacher was a, a fellow called Roy Smeck, who was born in 1900. He's called the Wizard of the Strings. And that's because he played all these different, you know, he played banjo and ukulele and uh, tenor guitar, regular guitar. He was just a man of many, many talents. He was a vaudevillian also. His focus was as much, believe it or not, and I, was, I would have been about 11 when I started studying with him. His focus was as much on being an entertainer and letting the people who are watching you, if people are watching you, know that you're having a good time and know that you're delivering something for them. So that's totally priceless. Uh, I would encourage your listeners to look him up. There's a bunch of old YouTube videos of him. And so that must have been pretty inspiring then to have such an incredible musician. Uh, he, and he was a wonderful man. I mean, he really set a very high bar for me to follow when I became a teacher. You know, how did you actually uh, uh, get to meet these incredible musicians? Well, it was really good luck. Um, we had moved into, from Queens into Manhattan when I was 10. Somehow my parents found him and brought me to him. He was literally like two blocks away from where I lived. And at that point, in it would have been the early 60s, he had pretty much settled into basically teaching. He had a huge entourage of students. And I'd come by once a week, and he would just blow my brains away. <laughs> and he would do, I mean, funny enough, you know, as well, one of the other things that was magical about him is he was also into all different styles. So to keep his students interested, you know, as a project, I would take on Malagueña. And then I would take on something akin to Guitar Boogie Shuffle. And then I would do the uh, St. Louis Blues. You know, so his, his, his regimen as a teacher was, and it's something that I developed also, was what does the student want? What does the student need? How can I delight the student? so that the student will come back for the next lesson with their game having gone up. Make sense? And the third teacher I had as a, was a uh, lovely jazz guitar player called Sal Salvador, who did a lot of playing with big bands, uh, did a fair amount of his own recordings as well. Um, and he was a real jazzer. You know, he, he was just like... Uh, and he was a very, very strict teacher, as compared with Roy, who was kind of all over the place. How can I make you feel good? You know, Sal was, if you're doing a, a, a scale study and you've gone through 23 bars of a 24 piece and you messed up a note, he said, no, go back to the beginning. You know, so it was like, mm, OK. So he, he was very regimented, but it also led me to like, well, you can't mess this one up, man, you know. So there's this whole headset of having to perform, even if it's in, in a lesson. When I listen to your playing, I, I definitely, I, I almost felt like there was a nod towards Les Paul. I almost felt like you had the jazziness, you had the bluesiness, obviously, you know, with Steely Dan, you, you know, that's going to be un, unavoidable, you know, that whatever you play, it's like it, that that's the base of it. But I also, you know, because, um, how can I explain this in a right way? 
It's like very guitar-y. Like you know how to use the guitar. That's something Les Paul really understood. How, like Chet Atkins as well, how to use open strings. Mm. You know what I mean? And and obviously reeling in the years with you know, that's very guitar orientated. It only really works. You can play it on a piano, but it doesn't have the same effect as all those hammers and pulls off. Mm. So it, it, it was was Les Paul an influence, or do you think it was an influence of the people that were teaching you? I think he was an influence in a subtle way. I used to listen to their, you know, Les Paul and Mary Ford recordings and just get blown away. It was so crystalline and and just, it made you smile, it made you laugh, you know? So those qualities of Les absolutely are there. We wound up having a jam one day, actually, funny enough, and it was an amazing little band. It was in Cleveland. They flew a bunch of us out to Cleveland. And the band was Les Paul, myself, Hal Blaine on drums, oh. Will Lee on bass. And we just had the kind of a ball that you can only imagine. You know, it was wonderful. And Les, as, a, as, a, um, as an interpersonal guy, he was really funny because on the one hand, he could be a used car salesman from Detroit <laughs> but on the other hand, he was this charming, incredibly inventive, smart guy who just, he knew his stuff. He was proud of it. Um, he used to tease everybody. See this box here? You'll never know what's inside here. <laughs> yeah, that kind of. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, thank you very much for the compliment. Thank you. Thank you. I got some more. I can, If you want, I can give you some more influences. Please, yeah. Yeah, give me. All right. Let us know. I'll who. scroll down. I've actually got my website up, so I'm going to scroll down my pages here. Late fifties, early sixties. Dwayne Eddy, The Ventures, Jorgen Ingman, who had a different version of Apache to what you had over here, which was unbelievable. A guy who was really, really special to me was a fellow called Howard Roberts. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and he had the first album that I heard of his was HR is a Dirty Guitar Player. And, you know, it just completely destroyed my mind. And I had to learn what the heck he was doing. Well, I'm not really a bebopper, so I can't say that I could jump onto some of his more beboppy things. But boy, could I appreciate it. You know, just absolutely wonderful. You can get into the more classical stuff where um, my mom, the first two concerts that she took me to were Andre Segovia, and Carlos Montoya. Wow. We just finished a video, which hasn't gone up yet, on uh, Andres Segovia. We did a whole a video on him, yeah. What a, a special, special man. I love James Burton and Scotty Moore. And, uh, you know, a, along with that ilk, you got Hank Garland, uh, obviously Chet. Uh, from the Lawrence Welk show, there was Buddy Merrill and Neil Levang, who both played these really sparkly new Fenders. And uh, they really swung. They were really, really great players. But if we want to get a bit more mainstream, there's a guy called Billy Butler, who actually, if you're familiar with Honky Tonk. Absolutely. That's Billy. When I teach, I haven't taught in a year because of the, the uh, social distancing stuff. right? And I don't like to teach over Skype. To me, if I'm teaching, I want to be in the same room. I want to see a student's posture. I want to be able to... Take, put my hand over here and say, no, no, move this finger over there. And you really can't do that on a video. And I, I actually did an instructional video for DCI many, many years ago. And the, the goal was to try to make something that was as user-friendly as possible. But I always feel like there's something about the cutting of dimensions that it's nice if you're just watching as, as, you know, as, as an observer and you're you know, watching some great band on video. But if you're actually trying to teach the instrument, and I know that there'll be lots of people who disagree with me, and that's cool, but I like the one-on-one. -on -one. I'm a big one-on-one -on -one guy. Now, in terms of more guitar players, Bob Bain will be a name that a lot of people won't rec recognize, but he was really, he was, he was one of the wrecking crew. He was one of the early Los Angeles guitar players. Now we can get into the R&B realm, and I could tell you who I really loved and still love in terms of their styles and what they brought to the ball game is Curtis Mayfield, um, Steve Cropper. Oh, yeah. B.B. King, Robert Lockwood Jr. 
And then we can get a bit jazzier and go into, you know, Wes Montgomery, who's an all-time favorite, Kenny Burrell, Johnny Smith, uh, Grant Green. And then scrolling down to the mid-60s, early 70s, obviously Cornell, with whom we, about whom we spoke. Then Hugh McCracken, David Spinoza, who were both really, really big-time New York studio guys. And sweet as could be. My friend Jack Douglas talks about Hugh McCracken endlessly on, on so many sessions in the late 60s and, and 70s in New York. He's so well-loved. Yeah. He really, really, you know, it's just... I'm sorry he's gone, you know. Yeah, very sad. Um, but, man, he taught me so much. Did you did you get to sit with him one-on-one -on -one or just from listening to the records? Oh, no, just sitting in, in, in the next booth on recording sessions. We did loads of recording together. So other essential influences would include the following composers, George Gershwin, Aaron Copeland, Lenny Bernstein, uh, Charles Stepney from Chicago, Galt McDermott, the guy who wrote Hair, a fellow named Carmen Moore, who is a really very avant-garde composer. And we've had many adventures together. At one point, one of my high points of my sort of performance career was um, Carmen had been hired by, well, this is in the mid-70s, I think. So it was the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. Hong Kong that year was looking to knock off Paris from being the number one fashion designer. So it was all about a fashion show. So Carmen was hired to compose a full-length symphony called Four Movements for a Five-Toed Dragon. And the cast of characters was phenomenal. Uh, I was part of a, a jazz quintet. And again, I don't consider myself a genuine jazzer, even though some people might say I, I uh, sort of find myself moving into that area a little bit, which I do. Um, but the, tr the, the, qu the quintet was Richard Davis on bass, uh, Warren Smith on drums and percussion, uh, a fellow called Ken Bichel on keyboards and synthesizers, myself and Sam Rivers, the flautist. Beautiful. So it was like, and all of these guys are so far out that, you know, you could sort of find ways to play things that weren't necessarily written, but were inspired by the players in the spur of the moment. And so it was great. So there were the five of us, and they flew over the entire Sorbonne Symphony Orchestra from Paris. <laughs> So they had a lot of they had a lot of dash, and long story short, um, we were there for about five weeks. That's incredible. <laughs> which, in terms of getting to know a place, it's a lot better than when you're, you know, jumping back on the tour bus or on the airplane the next day. So it was a cultural experience, and a lot of what I did in that in that symphony, aside from playing guitar, was to play a Chinese instrument called a pipa. And what is that? P -I it's a P-I-P-A. It's about this big, maybe. Um, and the neck has these triangles carved in it, which meant that you could bend to your heart's content. Mm. And, and the strings were nylon or catgut. I'm not sure which. <laughs> let's, let's hope it was nylon. <laughs> and um, and it, was, um, it was a fantastic instrument. It was just one of those things you don't hear every day. So, so again, you know, a chance to go into another dimension. 